We are inside three days to the Orange Bowl in Miami's home game against Wisconsin. Uh, one of the New Year's six as the Badgers and the Canes get together. We bring in Cam Underwood from State of the U to help us uh, each and every time talk Miami football. Cam, how you doing tonight? Good, good. So, uh, you know, just enjoying my holiday season. So happy holiday, holidays, excuse me, to everybody. And uh, our holiday, our Miami Hurricanes holiday is coming up on Saturday with the Orange Bowl. So I'm excited. I am too. Anytime uh, two of the big weights, uh, the power weights uh, from, from the big conferences get together, I enjoy uh, those games, especially at the top of the, the conferences. And we had a couple teams that made conference championship games in Wisconsin and Miami. Before we dissect this one, Cam, we spoke a week out from the first of the signing days. And I want to get your take on what turned out to be the at least initial class for Miami. And at that point, you had projected that uh, just about everyone that could sign would sign during the uh, early signing period. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, it was hectic timing, being that it was December 20th to 22nd of the early signing period. Um, so, you know, winding down your, your work time uh, before the, the holiday season and, you know, traveling. Well, I didn't travel. My mother and uh, came down here. So, you know, things like that. But there was a lot going on. So it was a, it was a hectic time. Uh, and if the early signing period stays there, it's going to be challenging uh, for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. But um, regardless of the challenging timing, Miami made out like bandits, honestly. Um, excuse me, 19 of the 20 committed players signed early. 18 of them signed on the first day of the early signing period. And the last one of those 19 who signed, uh, his ceremony was on that Thursday, so the second day of the early signing period. So that's everybody in this class who was committed other than Nesta, Nesta Silvera at this time uh, who has signed, um, which is pretty cool. That's, a, that's, that's really good. So, um, yeah, Miami's heavy on skill position players on offense and defense in this class. Um, I think we have nine or 10 All-Americans um, out of those players. Nesta Silvera and Lorenzo Lingard were only today named the uh, USA Today Offensive and Defensive Players of the Year for the state of Florida, which is pretty cool. So as you're looking through uh, multiple state champions in the group of commits um, and just some elite players all over the field. So that, that was pretty awesome um, from top to bottom. Nesta Silvera is a defensive tackle. He's the only one who did not sign, but um, – Everybody, all the reports are that he's going to sign in February, but he wants to be part of the recruiting process for a couple of his teammates from American Heritage who are going to be visiting in the January window. Uh, and he, if he were already signed, he could not accompany them on those official visit weekends. But since he did not sign, now he can go with his homeboys from uh, high school trying to get them to go to Miami. So just across the board, it was uh, it's just it's a strong class. Um, Georgia. Um, they made a really great move to get to wars number one. They added a bunch of players during the early signing period who were not already committed. Same thing with Clemson. They added a couple players that were not already committed to them. A couple that we thought were already going to go there. One person, a five-star offensive tackle out of the state of Ohio, Jackson Carmen. Um, some say he's the number one offensive tackle in America for this recruiting cycle. He was a late surprise for Clemson. So, um, and I say those things to say that Miami, while being ranked third or fourth going into this early signing period, ranks fifth or sixth, depending on the the site or the uh, ranking group that you're looking at. But that's still elite, especially for uh, Miami, which has been good at recruiting, but not great in the recent past. And also, Mark Richt has said there's about expecting between 24 and 27 kids in this class. So if you count Nessa Silvera as going to sign, that would take us to 20, which means there's seven more additional spots available in this class. Now, depending on how you finish with those, um, there's room for elevation in the recruiting ranking. But, you know, being around that top four, five, six group, um, regardless of the ranking, I'm going to take the group that Miami has signed. Um, and I can run down that if you want. But, I mean, there's there's some nice players in this class. They're already signed. A bunch of them, I think 10 or 11, are going to enroll early. So uh, they're going to hit the ground running. Hey, Cam, according to Rivals, the last five Miami recruiting classes have ranked 11, 21, 26, 19, and 12. I got two of those out of order, but the same numbers. 11, 21, 26, 12, and 19 for an average of 17.8 in the country. Certainly nothing wrong with that. Not bad. But 
number one in the ACC at a time when Clemson has emerged as possibly the best football program in the country. And Florida State, despite having a down season and the Jimbo Fisher effect, who knows what the effect was. I don't know where they ranked. I haven't looked it up. Uh, you're, you're talking about top five talent at Florida State each and every year, as long as they've been recruiting almost each and every time. This Miami class is the best in the ACC, clearly, and it's number six in the country. That's what uh, the ranking is currently, according to 247 Sports. Why the difference this year? Um, I think that you're seeing um, the positive interaction on the field, i.e. we're winning games, is a big thing. And I talked about this the last time that I was on with um, the change in paradigm for recruiting for this cycle, which has locked them down and really use that Mac Brown, Texas kind of uh, mentality, having those junior days get everybody in and having that camaraderie between the kids be the thing that drives the recruiting. So the official visit weekend, um, December 15th weekend before the signing period, Mark Richt openly said after the signing day, and he could talk about the kids by name after or the early signing period. On that first day, he had a press conference after most of the guys had signed. And once they've signed, and then you can talk about them by name. And so Mark Rick did, and he said, you know, the visit weekend last weekend, by bringing in 18 guys, it was because, uh, well, 17, excuse me, I think, uh, visited the weekend before signing day because Jaron Williams had previously visited for the Notre Dame game for his official, and then Nessa Silvera saving his for January. So you brought in all the other guys, I want to say, out of that group, and it's – it was hard for Mark Rick to really spend the same time that he normally would when you only have five or six official visits. So he said, I can't visit. I can't have that meeting with everybody that takes an hour. I can't do all those things. But what we're banking on is the camaraderie of, uh, camaraderie of that group is really what does the deal. That's what makes the recruiting work. And I think that that's really what we've seen. Uh, Miami identified a lot of guys early and it, there was not a lot of changing. Um, targets. It wasn't, okay, I'm going to recruit you for a little bit, and then I'm going to go over here. It was like, no, you're my guy, and come hell or high water, I'm recruiting you. Um, and I think that that really paid off. So, you know, it's just a different kind of interaction. Uh, Matt Doherty in the recruiting department, he's the uh, director of recruiting, uh, putting on all these events on campus, off campus, coordination of who's going to go where, when, uh, on the assistant coaching staff, and then Mark Rick himself uh, really spearheaded everything for that. Got a couple shout-outs from Mark Rick at his uh, press conference, so I want to shout him out as well. So, yeah, you know, just changing things up a little bit. And, uh, again, winning games is the biggest thing, you know, and if we're talking about – I mentioned this before, where Patrick Sertan Jr. was not considering Miami at all and now is to some extent. I'm not going to say that Miami is like, at the top of his list, but they're on the list when before they had not been. If Miami would have went 8-4 and four in the regular season again or, you know, 7-5 and five, or, you know, something like that, I guarantee you that Pat Sertan Jr. would not have thought of Miami. But with a positive uh, change in the record on the field, now you're seeing some of those things that are, are changing uh, on the landscape of recruiting. So uh, really, you know, using the peer level recruiting, changing the timeline of recruiting, and then just the event planning uh, for the whole recruiting process. I think all those things put together with winning games, I think that's why you're seeing an uptick in Miami's recruiting. Cam Underwood joining us from State of the U. Uh, please join him right there for the best in Miami football coverage. And uh, before we move on to the game, I'd like to say this. So uh, Cam came on a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we typically divide these uh, conversations into segments, usually four or five segments, something like that. We're in excess of 13,000 views. So that's this is a testament to Cam's knowledge, his insight, his entertainment value. Uh, he's been coming on here for two to three to four years, whatever the – the time period has been so I, I encourage you to go on state of the U because it's I'm not going to try to kid anyone to say that I'm on there uh, every day or even once a week. But I've been on dozens and dozens and dozens of times as I try to watch uh, everybody across the country. So I frequent uh, state of the U uh, several times a month. They, they do a first rate job in covering Miami football. Cam, uh, as a spillover effect, is kind enough to come on here and provide us with uh, insight and information and entertainment value, again, uh, covering Miami football. So please join him on State of the U uh, as we get uh, ready for this big showcase. So, Cam, you talk about winning games, meaning an impact on recruiting, and this is another showcase for the Canes 
on Saturday night at home with the entire nation watching. Anybody who wants to watch college football has to watch these two teams play, and why wouldn't you? They are two upper-tier teams, two top-ten teams that lost conference championship games and uh, that uh, are near the top of their conferences, and it should be a battle of styles, a battle of will, two very tough-minded, hard-nosed teams defensively going at it when uh, Wisconsin comes to town. Yeah, and uh, Miami played Wisconsin in 2009 in the um, – there was some bowl game, Russell Athletic Bowl, I think it was called then, up in Orlando. Um, and, yeah, you know, it's, it's really speed versus power, you know, size versus skill, uh, as if you will, um, between the two teams. So it's going to be a – it's going to be a good game. You know, I'm really looking forward to Miami winning this game and then spinning that forward towards next year, uh, kind of like we did this past year when we blew out of Virginia – or, sorry, West Virginia in the bowl game last year, and then that spun forward to this past season. So, um, you know, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be great. You know, I really am excited. It's a home game. Uh, Miami is the home team, and it's in our home stadium. And I know that there were some people who were saying, oh, you know, those guys, they want to travel. But I'm like, it's a premium bowl game, and it's in your city. So uh, I, all the – uh, friends and family members can come down for that and everything. Uh, and, you know, I do like to have some kind of coordination going on between what I wear uh, on the on these videos and what the team wears. And I went with the all black because that's right. We're going back to the all black, um, the Merck squad, the uh, Miami Knights, I believe they call it jerseys uh, for the bowl game. So I know that Wisconsin's probably going to go and they, you know, they're not a a team that does a lot of different uh, jersey <laughs> options. So they do, you know, yeah. white over white or red over white, and that's pretty much it because, you know, Barry Alvarez doesn't get tricky with it. And there's something to be said for a classic jersey. So you're going to have the classic white over white for um, for them and then the all black everything for Miami. So it's going to be interesting, um, and it's, it's going to be a showcase. You know, it's December the 30th. It's a Saturday night. Um, and I love that because then gives you all of New Year's Eve and all that stuff to, you know, recover from that and then go back out and party again and all those kind of things. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. You know, they were their division champion in the Big Ten West. We were our division champion in the ACC Coastal. Uh, neither team had the performance in the their respective conference championship game that they would have wanted. But this is a time when both teams are really going to look to to end their season on a high note and spin that towards next year. And for Miami, that is really a year ahead of schedule based upon everything that everybody thought going into this year. Um, getting this win would be really house money. And then you take that and you build upon that with those 10 or 11 early enrollees that I talked about with the team that's coming back. And, you know, hopefully some of these guys who have the option to leave early for the NFL or not, I hope that they stay. And then that gives us a bigger foundation stepping up into next year's season opener at Jerry World against LSU because that was a season 2018 that when Mark Rick got here, that's what everybody was pointing to and saying 16 is going to be what it's going to be. 17 is going to be a step and 18 is the year that we're shooting for. So <laughs> you start really that season now. And hopefully, you know, we see that kind of performance that we would want. Um, I remember the last time that we wore the black jerseys against Virginia Tech was awesome. Um, so hopefully we have that same kind of performance and get some payback on Wisconsin also, because the last time we played, they, they beat us pretty badly. And I'm tired of that. I, for one, Cam, would be very disappointed to see Wisconsin come out and look like Oregon. I expect Wisconsin to look plain. I, I, I expect Penn State to look a certain way. I just expect Wisconsin to, to be who they are. They're from the Midwest. They're hard workers. They're coming from the farms. And uh, they're, they're going to dress nice and plain and wear their white over white, red over white, as you explained, with the big W on the side. And there are no deviations to that. So I would think, yeah, that you know, and it's be white over white with the, the black for Miami, I would think. Yeah, I, I think that they are. And I mean, they could go with their home colors with the red over the white because it's a bowl game. So you can do that for an exhibition. But, you know, there's something to be said for a classic uniform. You know, I grew up in Detroit and the Detroit Red Wings, that was it. They had the red sweater and the white sweater. And everybody did these, you know, uh, third and fourth options. And, you know, no, it was that was it, you know. And the Yankees are one of the classic uniforms in all sports. And, you know, they got the gray on the road and the pinstripes at home. And that's it, you know, except for they did finally put the names on the jerseys for that player's uh Players only weekend when they let them have the special nicknames and the but that was like a really 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 super super special thing. So for Wisconsin, yeah, I'm good with them 
keeping it classic, being traditional. And I mean, there's something to be said for that. You know, it's tradition for a reason. And in their case, tradition has worked, obviously, with Barry Switzer, excuse me, Alvarez having been there uh, and everything. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm excited for it. You know, it's going to be, you know, light versus darkness and, and everything. And, you know, hey, I'm, I'm good to bet on the black. So let's go. Cam Underwood on board, State of the U. Uh, join him right there for the best in Miami football coverage. And, of course, subscribe to my YouTube channel if you love college football. Freshman Jonathan Taylor, we talked about him last time, 1,847 yards and 18 touchdowns. The thing that I will bring up here and would like to get your reaction to is he trampled over everyone except Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship. 41 yards rushing. Wisconsin could not budge that defensive line. 60 yards rushing. I would think that Miami, th this is my opinion, you jump in here. I think Ohio State's better along the defensive front, even though Miami's very good. I think Miami is better linebackers than Ohio State, so I think it pro probably evens out in, along the front seven. Uh, they are the two best front sevens that uh, Wisconsin will face this year, and they did not fare well in the ground game against Ohio State, i.e. Miami should have a fighting chance to do something in, in uh, stopping Mr. Taylor. Yeah, and, you know, I think that it's really the same conversation that we had before the Notre Dame game because Josh Adams was running over everybody, you know, 33 truck and whoop, whoop. That's what they were talking about. Um, Notre Dame won the award for the, having the best offensive line in football. Um, they have two guys, Quentin Nelson and Mike McGlinchey, who people were saying could be first-round picks, and we smacked that. That was weak. You know, and Miami, you know, you say, oh, they're going to lean on on Miami and, you know, Notre Dame's going to do this, that, and the third. And Miami came out there and we hit them in the mouth and they never recovered from it. And, I mean, we we stifled that running game. So, obviously, that's going to be the key against the Wisconsin offense. Any offense really is stopping the run. And that's going to be – that's going to really test Miami's front because – uh, Wisconsin's offensive line, as I've said before, is NFL sized. I mean, they average like 6'5, 322, I want to say, across the line. Like they're massive people. So they have that that they're going to try to use to their advantage as well. Jonathan Taylor uh, does get all the headlines because of, you know, the almost 1,900 yards and everything. You know, first team All American is a true freshman or second team All American, but, you know, first team All Big Ten. Um, there's other running backs that they can use as well. There's other things that they do in their scheme. So he is the the main guy in that running game, but he's not the only guy either. So even if he comes out for a game, a play, there's no relaxing because they're going to bring in another big, fast tailback who can hurt you. So you really got to look at that. And that's really where Miami is going to load up, I want to say. But it was clear in the ACC championship game that Miami was loading up to stop Clemson's run game. And then Clemson's offense said, cool, that's fine. We're going to go five wide spread, and we're just going to do these new passing combinations, quick throw slants, you know, screens, and all these different kind of things because you're all getting – it's like, oh, I'm going to be here on the inside. And like, okay, well, we're just going to go outside. And that was a very effective for Clemson, obviously, as you saw that game because – it it was so diametrically opposed to what Miami was doing. It took so long to change from that, oh, my God, we got to stop the run to, oh, what do we do now? Now we're changing our personnel groups. If we're going, you know, base 4-3, now we got to bring in a defensive back uh, to play the nickel, and then we got to move guys around because our nickel guy, Trajan Bandy, got hurt. Now we're bringing in Derek Smith, who's a mismatch on um, – the 13 kid Hunter Renfro because he can't he can't wiggle with Hunter Renfro so now that's a guy who's a, a more of a mismatch there and now okay now the, there's not guys in the box so you're doing this that and the third with a run game and it was just Miami was so discombobulated by the fact that they came out to throw so quickly and I fear that that's going to happen again because everybody knows about a Wisconsin offense I formation great tailback 1800 and something yards but if they go out and they try to change and put the script up a little bit, how quickly is Miami going to be able to adapt to that and also stifle that while also being aware of the running game? And that's really, I think, going to be one of the keys to the game for me. Um, just because, I mean, I know that Wisconsin is going to try to do something different because they can't just sit there and run up the middle because Miami's going to be ready for it. But is Miami going to be ready for whatever the different is while still not abandoning what they're trying to do to stifle the run game. That's going to be really tough. So um, we'll see what happens. 
Yeah, of course, Wisconsin wants to run it. And if you look at the formula, the pass run ratio for the Badgers, they want to throw it about 18 to 22 times and no more than that. And Alex Hornibrook has had his issues. Now, the one difference, the one first difference I will bring up between Clemson and Wisconsin, and there's several on offense, but the one that comes to mind in describing the the play off the run game that you described with Clemson is that Alex Hornibrook is not going to threaten anybody in the secondary taking off and running with it on a regular basis like Kelly Bryant <coughs> excuse me can break contain and, and do that so so that's something that uh, uh, Miami does not have to fear with Alex Hornibrook back there who led the Big Ten in interceptions and of course the turnover chain will be uh, clad all over the stadium at home. So uh, that's that's another part in this. Uh, this was a team that played its two best games against arguably the two best opponents they faced in the regular season at home and was most impressive against Virginia Tech and Notre Dame. Do you think that matters? Yeah, I think that the home game matters. I think that, you know, um, and also this team has lost for the first time in 13 months and then lost two games in a row. So obviously wants to get that uh, sour taste out of their mouth. But I'm going to go back to the quarterback thing for a minute because I was having this conversation on Twitter today. I want to see what the defense does against Alex Hornibrook because there have been average QBs who have like done numbers against Miami this year. If you look back at um, – the Virginia game, Kurt Benkert, he's average at best. And he like was Heisman trophy finalist in that game. If you look at North Carolina, Pittsburgh, um, Toledo, Logan Woodside is actually good. So I'm not really throwing him in there, but, and then, you know, Kelly Bryant is not really a good passer. He's not, but if you look at what he did against Miami in the ACC championship game, he looked very, that was one of the best passing games he had all year. So if you're talking about five of the 12 games that Miami has played, when an opposing quarterback with average talent played way above their pay grade, I it's I, and I know you were making the point that Alex Hornibrook cannot run like Kelly Bryant can run, but if he can throw the ball like Miami's been allowing opposing quarterbacks to throw the ball, that's still a problem. I mean, it's it was seemingly in the second half of the season every week. Okay, quarterback started 14 for 15 for 235 yards and three touchdowns. You know, okay, it's 11 for 12 for 200 yards and two touchdowns. So, like, you know, so that's a thing that I'm going to watch also because, you know, I, even with the turnover chain coming up so much, even with getting all these <clears throat> interceptions and things like that, you know, it's – Miami has to cover a little bit better um, in the secondary. And I know that was a strength throughout part of the season. But, you know, Alex Hornibrook, he's not the greatest corner, quarterback in the world. But, I mean, he's better than some of these guys that we face who mine is allowed to do really, really great numbers against. So I'm really looking at that. But, you know, hopefully maybe getting back to the, the question at hand right now, maybe hopefully playing at home at 8 o'clock is something that uh, the team will use as motivation to really step their game up across the board. but. Um, yeah, this is a, a tough and talented uh, team. Uh, they're a physical team, but they can't run with Miami. So th this is going to be, be like Virginia basketball, <laughs> which is going to walk the ball up, and they're going to run two or three sets, and they're going to shoot it at three seconds left every time because they're trying to keep the game in the 40s. Or like Wisconsin basketball, when Bo Ryan was there, they did that stuff for years. I hate watch. Those are the two teams that I cannot stand watching in college basketball because it's so slow. But I think that Wisconsin's offense and their team is going to try to slow this game down and make it into um, a dogfight where, like, Miami's speed is not able to really crease them. Because if you're talking about running, I mean, Jeff Thomas is gone. Like, he's he's out of the frame. I'm on Rich, he's, I'm on Rich is out for the game. I'm sorry, because he's done for the year. But Braxton Berrios is faster than most of the guys on that team as well. You know, you get guys in space, Travis Homer, you can make some plays. So they're not going to try to allow that. So they're really going to try to slow things down. But, you know, we really got to lock in. And hopefully this 8 o'clock kickoff time is something that will help this team really get back into that habit, get back into that focus, lock in and come away with a victory. So to expound on your point, uh, I want to set the record straight on Hornybrook. I watch Wisconsin play quite a bit. I watch the big games, Ohio State, Michigan, Iowa, and a few other times. Uh, he's not a bad quarterback. He makes some awful decisions. So there's a difference between a guy that can't throw and a guy that has a 
borderline NFL arm. He can make all the throws on the field. He makes the throws. He can thread the needle. He can drill it. He can deliver it. He makes a couple bad decisions a game. So if they got into his head, the coaches between the Big Ten championship game and now and eliminated those couple mistakes he makes per game typically, then that's that's going to be a different story possibly for the Badgers. On the other hand, obviously Miami creates more of those situations than almost anybody in America. So it's an interesting dynamic there between, <coughs> excuse me, Horny Brook and uh, the Canes on defense. And you bring up Berrios and uh, Thomas against Wisconsin. Uh, the Badgers known to be slow footed on defense. I think that's a bit of a stereotype, but there's no question the athleticism goes to Miami, but they have Dakota Dixon, Derek Tyndall, who's a good corner. So is Nick Nelson who led the Big Ten in passes defense. Uh, but Miami makes more big plays than just about anybody around. And Wisconsin gave up fewer big plays than anybody in the Big Ten by far. So that's their game on defense. You, you nailed that exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's you are who you are. And, I mean, I know that Miami is changing a little bit because we have a new coach, uh, even though he's not new to coaching, but uh, is slightly tweaking things when he's here. But Wisconsin has been Wisconsin, whether it was Paul Christ, whether it's uh, Gary Anderson before him, whether it was, uh, you know, Barry Alvarez. Um, they are who they are. And, you know, it, they've been consistent. They've been to Rose Bowls. They've, you know, not really challenged for a national championship, but they've been, you know, like you say, to the top of uh, the Big Ten uh, in the national kind of consequence or a conscience, I should say, uh, for many years. So, yeah, that's what they're going to do. They're going to try to slow it down um, and then not get creased by any big plays. But, you know, obviously we hope that big plays are able to happen because I'm really not sure that um, – Miami's offense can really sustain a 12, 13 play drive. So we're going to need uh, to hit you for 40 yards uh, when the ability or that opportunity is there. So hopefully, you know, for Miami's sake, uh, we see if that can happen. But yeah, I mean, I know that, you know, Derek Tindall is from, uh, he's from South Florida. He went to Stranahan High School, I want to say. You got Dante Carrier Williams, uh, who transferred. He was at Booker T and then he graduated from St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, you know, like they have some South Florida guys there, but like neither of those guys were elite speedsters when, you know, they left here to go to Wisconsin or anything. So I mean, I'm not going to say that like they're just everybody has cement feet. But I mean, yeah, if you look at the athleticism and speed on Miami's roster and then you look across the field, athleticism and speed, Miami wins that in the space. Now, if you're talking about size and strength, Wisconsin wins that battle. So, you know, it's really which one of those can uh, overcome the other will go a long way towards determining the victor in this game. This means absolutely nothing, but it would be interesting to know right this second how many NFL players are on each roster. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, you're going to count a few offensive linemen for Wisconsin. Uh, they usually have a five-star tackle that they redshirt just because that's what they do. So, I mean, but yeah, if you're, you're talking NFL talent on the rosters, I mean, you can count a few couple from Miami. So I would say that there's probably more from Miami. Um, but Wisconsin is not entirely devoid of talent. And sometimes, you know, there's, there's something to be said for being good at where you are. You know, there's guys who are really good high school players. Like there's a kid going to Louisville, uh, Chaterius Tutu Atwell from Miami Northwestern. He's like five foot eight, five foot nine. He plays quarterback. Uh, he's going to play slot receiver in Louisville. But at in high school, Nick is a great high school quarterback. You know, you look back to uh, years past for the Hurricanes, Brad Kaya was a pretty damn good college quarterback and, you know, wasn't obviously, you know, bouncing around in the NFL. But, you know, there's something to be said for being good at your current level and not necessarily saying, OK, well, we don't value you at all because of what could come in the future. Um, and Wisconsin, they got a lot of good college football players, man. So um, it's going to be a tough game. But I think that, you know, Miami, if, if Miami does what Miami needs to do, should be able to come away with a win. Okay, number six, Wisconsin, 12-1, and one, Big Ten runner-up, and the ACC runner-up, Miami Hurricanes, 10th ranked in the country, meeting on Saturday night. Let's watch it all. If you want to watch college football, you got to check out uh, the Hurricanes and the Badgers on Saturday night. Cam Underwood's from State of the U. Please join him and the rest of the staff in covering Miami football and basketball this time of year at State of the U. Cam, we appreciate you uh, stopping by one last time before – your boys suit up for the final time in 2017. Yeah, man. So it's, uh, you know, like I said, it's always good to be here. I and mean, this will be the last time of this calendar year because I know that we probably won't get up on Saturday or Sunday. So, you know, Happy New Year to you and everybody watching. And as per usual, go Kings.
All right, good stuff.